I spend no time on the cheering or the booze. I spend on executing so that when it goes to zero, 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 I can say I was right. You got your perspective. I just want to be happy. Don't you want to be happy? What is up, Singapore? Thank you. What up? Please sit. Thank you. So, a couple things. I know that it's been a long day, and so what I want to do is bring as much value as possible. So, we're going to try to do a bunch of Q&A. Uh, which I'm excited about. So I'm gonna set up some framework uh, for where I'm coming with with my current thoughts on entrepreneurship, marketing, kind of certain things I'm seeing. Uh, but most importantly, I definitely am excited to open up the Q&A session a little bit earlier than we had planned because I think that's where most of the value comes from. So I think the thing that I wanna start off with this this afternoon, this evening is putting into context something that's been running through my mind a lot lately, which is perspective. What's really fascinating to me is something that's emerged as almost difficult to fully understand, which is it's unbelievable that life is as basic as how do you see it. For me, I've I've been saying a lot lately and have always to a lot of people close to me a, a statement that says you find what you're looking for. If you're looking for negativity, it's very easy to find. If you're looking for positivity, it's very easy to find. If you think it's going to be successful, you start to see signals that lead to that, and if you think it's gonna fail, you'll see that. If you're cynical and a pessimist, that's what you see. If you're optimistic and positive, that's what you're gonna see. And really, the the vulnerability to the way I roll, which is optimistic and positivity, is you could become delusional. It's not practical. You think you can just dream it into success. You don't understand the requirements and the costs and the sacrifices that are needed to actually get somewhere. I think the biggest thing that I've been spending time on lately from a perspective standpoint is we are all now affected by the last 10 to 15 years of entrepreneurship and when we look at stories like Facebook or WeChat or Uber or Weibo, we see these extreme monstrous successes and they cloud the fact that for the 15 companies that actually got to billions in revenue and actually run actual businesses not predicated on venture capital, there's 80 trillion businesses that didn't, and we spend all our time fascinated on these enormous victories without spending our time on practicality. And so for me, what I really wanted to establish in this talk today is a couple things. One, the macro perspective I believe that I'm seeing in people that are succeeding, and when I say succeeding, I think an important part of perspective in today's day and age is I believe that the way we define success is fundamentally broken in human society. We are spending way too much money, uh, way too much time on putting money on a pedestal and way little amount of time and energy into putting happiness on a pedestal. The amount of millionaires, people that make millions, 10 millions, hundreds of millions of dollars a year that I know that are disproportionately unhappy is staggering. And I really, really, really am passionate about getting a conversation into the ecosystem of like, what are you, like, why are you here? Like, why are you actually here today? What are you trying to accomplish? And and do you have enough self-awareness and understanding about yourself to know what you're trying to achieve because I promise you, over this last decade, interacting with people at scale, publicly and privately, what's very obvious to me is that an enormous amount of people are trying to get success to put makeup around their actual insecurities and they're spending all their time trying to make money to hide what's actually happening They're trying to prove something to somebody else, not to themselves, and no level of you finding a path to making money 
is going to solve that issue. And so I think that we're living through a very, very remarkable time in our society where this device can really be an unlock to an enormous amount of things, but I don't think people actually know where they're going. And that's something that I've become unbelievably fascinated with. One of the biggest reasons I've found myself talking more about mindset and perspective and things of that nature was I spend every day putting out content that shows people exactly what to do with their personal brand or their business to be successful. And yet, people don't take advantage of the current state of the internet to achieve their business goals. And after a while, I started to have to ask myself, why are people not doing that? And I didn't go into the lazy talk of thinking people are lazy or things of that nature. It all led to one big game of insecurity. The reason a lot of people here don't post every single day is because they're worried about the judgment in the comment section of what they post. And so before I get into the details of what I want to talk to you about from a YouTube or a Facebook or a Twitter or a podcast or running ads, before any of that, I can give you every single tactic that is underpriced but if you don't have a foundational understanding of what you like to do and why, it's impossible for you to be successful because we now live in a world where somebody will outwork you and take your peace. And there's abundance and there's plenty for everybody, but what has become very clear to me is nobody beats the person that loves what they're doing and is good at it because they're just always doing it. What became obvious to me about entrepreneurship is I always did it even when it wasn't cool or in the air like it is now. What's obvious to me today is there's so many people that want to be entrepreneurs because it is cool today and it's actually not who they should be. The amount of people in this attendance today who want to be entrepreneurs or start companies who would be far more successful financially and happy being the number four in a company run by an actual entrepreneur is staggering. That's not something that anybody in here who's delusional wants to hear, but it is still absolutely the truth because any time a pendulum swings, it swings too far the other way. Only 15 years ago, Not going to college was not even in the cards, especially not in Southeast Asia. And yet now people are debating that and aspiring to that at scale, even if it has nothing to do with who they actually are. They've just created the perception that starting your own company and being an entrepreneur is the right or cool or awesome thing to do. The only reason you should be at this conference at all is for you to find a path to being content and happy, not to make an arbitrary amount of money. I wanna make a million, I wanna make 10 million, I wanna make, arbitrary. You're just picking a fucking number out of your ass. What you need to be doing, thanks mom, what you need to be doing, what you need to be doing is deploying the greatest game of self-awareness anybody has ever done. This is one big game of self-awareness. I don't want you to do what I do. I was a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old child who'd rather go and shovel snow and wash people's car and sell lemonade than go outside and play. I was a kid who never opened up a single textbook from fourth grade until 12th grade. That is not necessarily who you are. And so, I start this conversation, you know, I flew a long way to come here to create a very important conversation, far more important than me telling you that Instagram ads in stories are so underpriced in all of Southeast Asia that if you start buying ads on Instagram stories for two and three dollar a CPM swipe up ads to a direct link to whatever you do, whatever you sell, As important as that tactic is, as important as it would be for all of you to leave this conference, go home, Google how do I write 
how do I run Instagram story ads? As much as it would matter for me to tell you that if you target a certain group of people, then make the content for that group, then run $50 worth of ads, then look at the quant data, then adjust it and keep adjusting until your cost of acquisition is worth your lifetime value, as important as that is, as basic, as basic as that is, and important, and would work for 75% of this audience to achieve whatever you want, that tactic is bullshit if the only thing you're trying to do is make money, because it is not sustainable. And so look, I'm really, really hopeful that my opening kind of 10 minutes here sets the tone to what I'm trying to achieve, which is, as I continue to evolve and travel and do all this stuff, the same themes are coming up over and over and over, and I want to remind everybody here, we have lived through a decade now of economic growth and prosperity across the world. We are in a bubble. There's so much money and opportunity in the system that this is not sustainable. There will be a day of reckoning, just like there was in 2007, eight, just like there was in 2001 and 95, and for people that have lived through some down cycles, you think it's hard now, when all the money dries up, it gets real hard. Let me say it very basically. If you don't have a successful company right now and you've been operating for the last two years, you suck. And I mean that, like I, I, and I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to razz, I'm not trying to come hard, I need you to understand how many people here run a company or an entrepreneur startup? Just raise your hands. Raise it high. I need you to understand, if you're running a company right now, in the globe, this is the easiest time in the history of humans to run a company. So if you're not doing well, you need to really recognize that. You, you do. And so I'm unbelievably optimistic because this thing is that special. I'm this optimistic because the little piece of business advice in practical terms that I slipped in five minutes ago, I'm gonna say it one more time nice and slow, it will legitimately work for 80% of this audience. Instagram story ads in all of Southeast Asia except in Japan and China where other platforms dominate, not Instagram, will work for your business, but what you have to figure out is your targeting and your creative. The biggest reason people don't succeed in running ads on social networks and platforms is because they don't make enough content. And they don't make the content for the audience they're trying to reach. They make one piece of content and try to reach everybody. Contextual creative at scale is the game. It's really interesting. I've been really watching a lot of businesses and entrepreneurs navigate the last year or so, and what's really become interesting to me is the themes that play over and over and over again. In its most basic, the biggest thing that everybody has to leave here with is the following thing. The only thing that you should spend all your time on to really disproportionately grow your business is to figure out where the customer that you're trying to reach spends all of their time. Once you understand where they spend all of their time, all you should ever do is try to figure out how your brand, your personal brand, your business, can penetrate that attention in the form of organic content or in the form of ads. It's that basic. When I look at the data in Singapore, and I don't know if some of you heard, but VaynerMedia is opening an office here in a couple of months. The reason we're coming to the entire region is that everything that I've used to build up my personal brand, to build business results, all of that works better in this market than it even does in Europe and in the US where we've been doing that marketing. For me, the quicker everybody here can become a media company, the quicker they can become successful. 
the quicker you think of yourself not as a salesperson, but as somebody who produces content that provides value to the end user, the quicker you will get results. The reason most people struggle with social media marketing or digital marketing or marketing or communications is because they're salespeople, they're not marketers. The difference is very simple. When you look, and I did, a lot of people tagged this event, tweeted at me, so I looked at 20 or 30 of the accounts here over the last 12 hours. When I look at your accounts, everything is selfish. Everything is about what you're selling, what you want them to do for you. All the content is there to get more likes, to get more followers, for somebody to buy your product, go into your funnel, create a capture of data at the top so you can remarket to it. It's 100% selfish. That is exactly what all of you don't want in your normal life from the other people you consume. But it's exactly what the far majority of people are doing with their own content for their own business. This is one big game of being over selfish instead of being selfless. One of the reasons the biggest book I ever wrote was called Jab, 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 Right Hook was it helped so many people understand a different framework which is you have to give, you have to give, you have to give, and then you can ask for something. The problem is when people ask, they expect. The disproportionate reason that I see businesses be successful and definitely personalities be successful are the ones that give without expectation because the content when they give is not loaded with intent to be selfish. There's a lot of people that give, but it's a half give. It's actually an ask disguised as a give. What's happened is there's so much content now on the internet, there's so much supply of information as remarkable as these channels are, what's amazing is that every one of you can be in it. The problem is every one of you can be in it. So what happens is the cream rises to the top. So what's happening is it's very hard to break through if you're being selfish because somebody else is being selfless. This is how life has always been the maturity has now hit this device. Couple things I wanna talk about before I go into Q&A. Number one, you have to figure out as a person, as a business, how you communicate to the world. There are three ways, written word, audio, and video. Too many people are trying to do video when they're not capable of it. Too many people are not realizing written word is remarkable and they're getting caught up in pictures because Instagram's popping. So, the number one thing that would really matter to me as a data point is the following. I believe the more content that you put out, the more likely you'll be successful. I believe that you have to reverse engineer the end consumer, that you have to bring as much valuable content to them as possible. I think that you also need to eliminate friction between your message and the customer. What that means is you have to show up everywhere to the best of your ability in the way they wanna consume it. How many people here listen to my podcast? Raise your hands, thank you. Real quick, hold them up real quick. Watch this, everybody look around, keep it up, listen to my podcast. Now, how, keep it up, keep it up, I wanna show everybody something. If you did not listen to my podcast two years ago, put your hand down. What everybody just saw, what, thank you very much, what everybody just saw is not only the rise in my popularity, you are seeing the rise of audio consumption. How many people here now listen to more podcasts than they did three years ago? Raise your hands. Look. How many people here now when they watch videos online actually don't even watch the video, they just put it down and just listen? 
This is what I spend all my time on. I didn't go all in on my podcast for my health. I went in all in on my podcast because I knew that you started listening to more audio, not read as much, not watch as much video. At the same token, probably the bis- best and biggest piece of advice that I can give this audience today is a really interesting one. When I wrote my last book, Crushing It, I did not even talk about LinkedIn. Wasn't even part of my book. As I stand here today, as somebody who spends all his time trying to figure out where the underpriced attention is, the number one place that's emerged for me in the last three to six months has been LinkedIn. How many people here are producing content for LinkedIn? Raise your hand. Nice. Solid, but an extremely low percentage of this audience. If I can leave you with another tactical piece of advice today, it is for you to get very serious about LinkedIn. It is grossly underpriced attention, it's organic, and the amount of reach it's getting, even for people in here who've never posted once, is remarkable. So, LinkedIn written or audio or video content in a post, remarkable growth. It reminds me of Facebook in 2012. And I believe a lot of you, whether you're B2B or B2C, or how many people here have a job? Raise your hand. Job. How many people would like to leave their job and start their own business? Higher. The number one tactic, I believe, that can make 30% of the hands that just went up have a practical transition from going from a job to having their own business is strictly just blogging on LinkedIn on a daily basis around opinions and thoughts they have in the business that they're in or want to be in. Simple as that. The game is based on action. The game is based on action. And for me, the action that is most required is to be a content producer. I genuinely believe that no matter what your ambition is in this room, that if you are not producing written word, audio, or video for the internet on a daily basis, you will limit your upside and you will become vulnerable to competitors that are trying to reach the same audience you are. This is a very important mindset because what's remarkable about this is what I'm actually saying is Everybody in here needs to think more like a publisher and a media company than what they actually do for a living. Are you a lawyer? Cool, I also want you to write content every day. Are you a financial advisor? Awesome, I want you to write content every day. Are you a salesperson? Are you a tech SaaS founder? Are you this, that, the other thing? The gateway to everybody's ambition is content because communication is the foundational aspect of how everybody makes every decision. The reason there's so much scrutiny on big tech companies all over the world is because our attention is now there and that is changing our opinions about everything. There's a reason that when there's a coup in a country, they go after the newspaper, radio, and television first. Even before they raid the palace, They go for the media, because the media dictates how you think. A scary amount of every opinion in your head was put there by the content you consumed, by the content that your parents consumed and then put into your head. Your ability to put content into the ecosystem and create the outcome that you aspire to is the fundamental variable. This computer in my hand is more powerful than the computer that Ronald Reagan had running America only 30, 40 years ago. This is a remarkable shift in our society. And what's scary to me is how few people actually go all in and take advantage of it. How many people here consume my content? There's nothing I've said that you haven't heard before. I pound this message every day, every day. 
I come and I give it on stage because I'm hoping maybe because we're in person, you hear it this time. Or maybe because something happened yesterday, you hear it this time. I have, the reason, and by the way, I think, if, especially in this section first, if you have questions, you should line up right away because I'm gonna go into Q&A and then I'll open it up to everybody else. So if you have questions, you can go to left and right, I'll start. Um, I come here and pound this message because the reality is, is life is remarkably simple. Everybody overthinks this stuff dramatically. You've heard this from me consistently. This is exactly what is going on in our society. I'm just trying to figure out how I convince you to start actually making. I believe that producing content on the internet for you or your business is the equivalent of working out in the gym every day. There is no shortcut. But the results are there when you put in the work. I'm trying to figure out why you're not. That's how I've gotten into insecurity or keeping up with the Joneses or why I'm mad at every goddamn parent in the world. That's how I got there. Because there is absolutely no lack of information if you consume my content of LinkedIn or podcast or Instagram. As a matter of fact, as many of you know, I yell all the time, don't listen to what I'm saying, watch what I'm doing. If I have a vlog, there's a reason. If I'm posting on LinkedIn, there's a reason. If I'm using more Instagram TV in my main feed on Instagram, there's a reason. There's a reason. And so, I'm just unbelievably passionate about people figuring out the framework and then more importantly, figuring out why they're not doing the framework and then more importantly, what are you trying to accomplish? That's the question because we have to accomplish happiness. That has to be the goal and if you actually pressured yourself to be happy versus pressuring yourself to be a success, then you have a totally different conversation with yourself. Then you have a totally different conversation with yourself. And when you start doing that for yourself, not to prove it to your spouse or your siblings or your parents or the people you went to school with, then it gets really good. It gets really good when it gets really quiet. And it's super quiet for me. I don't hear the claps and I don't hear the boos. I just navigate. I love my process. I love the pain of being an entrepreneur. I love that it's lonely. I love the game. I just want you to love the game. Thank you. I left a lot of time for Q&A because this is where it's gonna get good. Let's go, my friend. What's your name? Hey there, Gary. My name is Nemo Ashong. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Yeah, this is my first time really getting into your world. Please. That last thing you said really bothered me. Please. You love being lonely. Yes. You asked why am I not taking action? It's because of the loneliness. Let's talk about it. All right? I am someone who is highly relational, and, I, and generally speaking, I'm an outlier, a pioneer, a maverick in anything that I do. One of the first, one of the only, or one of a kind. Okay. And it's very lonely out there. So my question for you is like, I wanna be able to build the next stage of my business through relationship. And I wanna be able to do it, and I, my, I think the question that's really coming out is, do I have to come off as an expert? Can I be there with people? Can I, can I record conversations? I love document, don't create. Yes. Can I record conversations with people that are just real and put it out there? I, I want to be able to create this from a place where it maintains the relationship without me having to be an expert, because honestly, I'm figuring it out too. It's a great question, brother. I appreciate you saying it. The biggest issue in our game right now is people thinking they have to fake it till you make it. Guys, faking till you make it was good when the internet wasn't around. Now people hear the bullshit coming out of your mouth. Every single kid that's ever tried to fake it until she or he made it in a meeting with me lost. Because I'm like, this person's full of shit, they're out. No, you don't have to be an expert as long as you don't say you're an expert. Do you know why I love Q&A? Because I'm not scared. Because I'm gonna answer all your fucking questions and if I don't know the answer, I'm gonna say I don't know. And that doesn't make me any less capable of standing on this stage. In fact, it is the reason I can stand on this stage. 
Bro, we grew up in a game where people fake it to them. Thank you. Thank you. I know, I know the world we all grew up in. I I'm, couldn't believe in social media more. I couldn't believe in Instagram more, but Instagram and social media is where everybody is faking it. Everybody's a PR agent of themselves. Everybody's showing the highlights. Social media is highlights. That's why I like putting out, the reason I started Daily V was to show you that it fucking was a grind. It's not private planes and parties and fucking Rolexes. It's fucking work. And so yeah bro, you can as long as you position it up front. That's it. Game on. You got it. Hi, Gary. Uh, my name is Meher. I'm from India. I've specially flown down. Thank you. Especially for you. Thank you. So uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated the way you are and the way you, you know, pro- project yourself as being so raw. And uh, one of the things I wanted you to ask You mean no you, fucking suit? Uh, yeah, no fucking suit. I mean, I like the t-shirt. I like your sneakers. And I, I love that. And uh, that's something which I'm proud of. Uh, I'm starting a digital marketing agency back in India. I have Good. two businesses which I created and I want to now fascinate about digital marketing. You're the first person I mean I would look up to. Uh, I wanted to ask you that the world is moving into doing things by themselves. You know, personal branding is one of the most important things. People, companies are also doing it by themselves. So in where housing? do you see, yeah, so where do you see where do you see the agency being okay. the support system for, for the companies, for smaller companies for that matter? It, they're gonna be a service if they're best. Okay. It's the same thing I just said. The best part about social is we can all play. The worst part is we can all play. Agencies have to be better if people are taking things in house. Okay, and uh, c- could you give some tips about how do we, you know, how do we give, get an edge against the, the rest of the gang? Because be, it's, be great at what you charge people for. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, Thank you for that. I know it's super simple. It but is. But like, why the fuck would I pay you if I could do it myself? Right. I would pay you because you're better at it. Yeah. Why do people hire a cook? Because he or she makes better food than they can or because they value time. Absolutely. Companies Absolutely. will always outsource and always insource things. Yeah. It's one big game of value. Absolutely. You have to explain to me why I should hire you, right? Absolutely. This is why I, when I started VaynerMedia, this is why I worked for free. When people came up to me and said, you know. That was my next question. You're I'm, starting your office in Singapore. Can I work for you for free? Hell yeah. Yeah. As long as it's legal here in Singapore, I don't know what the fucking rules are yet. But you can send me an email. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Gary. Hi. Hi, Gary. How are you? Welcome to Singapore. Thank um, you. I don't actually have a question for you. I'm here because I wanted to come to thank you personally. Um, December 2016, my fiance died in a motorbike crash overnight. And that meant I had to take over the company from being number four to number one overnight. And I had no idea. I panicked. And, yes. um, and also, I found your content and I had, it, I had it playing for like six months every day for like 48 hours just there, <laughs> you know, like blaring through the house. And, um, and that positive voice in the strategies, the advice, um, just the guidelines really helped helped me a lot and the company's doing great now. I mean, we're fine, we're growing and we're healthy. And, um, and I just wanted to say that I decided to put your voice in my head because it's the closest to my fiance's, except it's in English. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I'm extremely flattered. And um, so I, I came here because I wanted to say thank you for all the content that you've put out there. It's really great, it's helped me a lot, it saved my ass. And uh, you rarely get a chance to say thank you in person. I'd like to do that. Thank Thank you you. very much. Thank you so much. Hey there, Gary. Matt from Australia. I'm here with my sister, Fiona, as well. Um, Thanks for being a great mentor to us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Matt, curious, what does the structure of your team look like for you for you to drive your brand? And what is it going to look like in six months' time? And why will it change? It's a great question. So anybody who's looking to go crazy extreme like I have with content on an individual basis, I believe that you need a writer. 
I believe that you need a video person who can not only capture but can post, produce, and publish. Um, I think you need a designer image. So I believe those three things are completely required to go all in. You probably then, when you have three people and you're busy, you probably need an architect of that, that three-person team who can synthesize you and manage that team. So more than a project manager, actually. Did you say architect? Or is Notice that how like? I used architect yeah. versus project manager. I think a project, and, and by the way, project management has saved Vayner, so I don't want to downsize this, but the way I think about it just to, and I wouldn't even use project manager because I put such a pedestal, you need somebody who thinks and makes people do who, not just somebody who takes direction from you and makes people do, because you're busy. Yeah. You know, I think the big thing with me that's so crazy is I know that I'm Gary Vee, I run a $200 million, thousand person global company every day. I'm the CEO and COO. I'm not in an ivory tower, I'm in my shit. I'm on HR calls, I'm on, pro, like, like, so th- I figured out this by accident. Right, these, all these pieces of content you see is me living my life and it's just being captured. And it's only 10% of my life. So you need those people. I think you need an audio engineer, similar to the video person, somebody who can strip the audio and upload to a podcast, because I think a podcast and audio content is a requirement in six months. So look, you're talking about a four or five person team. Awesome, thank you. You got it. Hi, Gary. How are you? My name, I'm good, thank you. My name is Mary. I'm from Indonesia. Um, to be honest, before last year, I don't know who is Gary Vee. Never I heard of you before. But I attended NAC last year and I listened to you. I follow your advice, create contents every day, and uh, it helps me. That's thank how you. I grew my... Um, I have 2 million uh, followers in Instagram right now. And uh, that's how I grew my... YouTube um, with 1.5 million subscribers, which is growing, so I thank you for that. Congratulations. So um, my question to you is simple. Um, you mentioned that create a video that you care about, not creating some things that you think will be popular, and I totally agree with you, but at the same time, you also care so much about um, how the, your audience, your end user, react on your content. So how do you balance between the two? by producing every day. I mean like. Think about it. Yeah? When you produce so much content, today, I'm just gonna make something I wanna make because tomorrow, I'll make something that you want me to make. When you're not crippled, every single piece of content, you can accomplish everything. The framework of producing content every day Mm -hmm. gives you permission to do many things when you look at it over a year, not over a day. Okay. If you're crippled by every piece of content, well then you have a struggle. When you realize that you're putting out 53 pieces of content this week, or seven, or five, well all of a sudden, you can do whatever you want on every individual piece of content, Mm -hmm. because you don't have to achieve both contrarian goals in a single piece of content. The reason I just put out that piece of content is everybody's falling into a trap of making content that works on the platform. Or you know what works, so you keep doing it, but then eventually it becomes boring for you or for them. It's very important to mix up your content, otherwise it becomes stale, either for the person that makes it or for the audience that consumes it. It's why I do Q&A. The first 20 minutes was something you've heard 5,000 times I just believe in it so much that I will say it every day for the rest of my fucking life. It's now when you may hear something completely different. That's why I innovated to Q&A to put me in a position to make it more interesting. Okay. You got it? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, Gary. How are you? Good. My name is Vikas and uh, I'm from a business family, but I was on a spiritual journey. So at the age of 29, I had my own awakening, sort of like a spiritual breakthrough. Yes. And I left my family, I've left the family business as yes. CEO, I started from all over again, zero. Yes. And I was on a mission to give wisdom to the world, to okay. bring wisdom to the world. Amazing. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years to businesses, CEOs, people in general. It's amazing. Teaching people about mindset and meditation. Now, uh, I want to grow the, grow the brand, grow the 
scale the business to reach more people globally. Yes. But now I hear a lot about that no one wants wisdom, bring it to the business, everyone is caring about making money. And Who says that? People on platforms like that. They're wrong. What do you advise I do? To bring fucking wisdom. <laughs> What would be the strategy to take it out of what I'm doing and bring it to more people around the world? Millions. To give the wisdom for free. Okay. Like me. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. And you know this, when you have no money, you want money. When you get the money, you want the wisdom. Everybody's on their own journey. There is no right answer. Right. Whether I say it or other people said something else, which I don't know, but I'm sensing, you need to do you. Hmm. Legacy is greater than currency. Wow, that's a good line. Thank you. <laughs> I like it too. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Gary. How are you, my friend? Hi, I'm good. So my name is Tom, and uh, I'm a watercolor artist. In fact, I have a painting. Watercolor. Yeah, Very nice. I have a painting that I'm going to give to you later backstage. Thank I hope you. I can take a photo of you. You sure family. can. Thank yeah. you. So my question is, as artists, what is the best way to leverage on the visual quality of art to uh, actually promote uh, my online courses on YouTube and to gain more followers and to give the most value? So you notice, you know, this is, I'm glad you said that. When you give, you have to give. The second I hear my online, online courses where you and many others, and I don't know what you're doing, could get caught, and when I say could, 99%, when you know that you're putting out something for free, that what you really want is for them to sign up for your online course, you're fucking dead. <laughs> Guys, there's a reason you like me more. <laughs> I'm not trying to funnel you into anything. I want nothing from you. I want you to tell me the story that young woman just said earlier. That's what I want. You know how much better that feels than signing up another person for my $6,000 thing? <laughs> that, bro. Because if you're putting out content, you have a visual product. You should be dominating. The reason you're not dominating is every time you post, you hope they go to your fucking course. Don't do that. Just put out great content and a funny thing will happen. They'll sign up for your fucking course. Okay. The intent of content is the variable of success. Let me say it one more time for the people in the back. The intent that you have when you put something out is the variable of how well it will do. Amen to that. Amen to that. Yeah. That's how you'll win. When teach people how to to help them, yeah. then you will get karma in return and you will sign up more people because when you're putting out content and they can sense what you're actually doing is trying to get them into the funnel to pay you, you're finished. And that's what everybody's doing. And yes, there are plenty of people that are successful. I know landing page optimization. I know, I get it, I understand. I understand funnels, I understand. It's a short-term game. And every day that goes by, it's losing leverage, not gaining leverage. I'm gonna make sure of it. Got it? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Gary. Uh, my name is Fang Jing. I'm a personal trainer. Um, I heard your message about being selfless instead of selfish. And, uh, yes. I also heard your message about um, producing content daily. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so when, when we produce content daily, and you, you're, you're saying to uh, the Indonesian uh, yes. lately that you just produce what you want, right? You just produce what you think is important. Um, but but do, we, do we leverage on the tools available like Basumo and where we, where we want to tell the customers what they want? Do, or do we just go ahead and produce what we want? Both. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Both. Both. This is the part that people keep struggling with. They, they analyze things at a surface level, not at a macro level. 
Like, when you put out content every single day, you can do anything. Guys, my number one successful post on Instagram in the last three years was me eating blueberries a couple weeks ago. (laughs) That's fucking crazy. But that meant that you guys have been getting so much of one thing for me that the second I gave you something else, you liked it. You can do both. That's what volume of content allows. It allows creativity. It allows you to be selfish and selfless. So, so do we like splice a bit of marketing inside or we just give it up for free? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Gary, how you doing? I'm Paul Evans. I've been in recruitment for 20 years. I've been living here for 10. Five years in Hong Kong, five years here in Singapore. I love it. Understood. I worked inside a bank and I've been recruiting for investment banks for that whole time. Yes all here in Asia. And uh, I joined LinkedIn in 2004. That's the only social media platform I actually joined. Right. Sad as it sounds. And uh, I didn't post anything until two months ago. I had a cycling accident and I shattered my collarbone. Sorry. And I had a titanium plate put in. And uh, I did a video straight after because I just felt there was a connection between people's careers and some of the observations I had through the experience of the accident. Interesting. Anyway, so I just put that out. And I got 8,000 hits, and I was shocked. So on the bed of the hospital, after the operation, I made another video for one minute and made another connection. And the message was really people not to beat themselves up, essentially. But the one concern I have now is, if that's from January startup, Paul, but actually, if I join a corporation yes. and I want to put out content yes. in the same manner, yes. which is, you know... It's from the heart, it's free, I'm not looking for any kickback, right? You don't have to overthink the politics of it. Right, so if you're in a corporation, as perhaps people are here, you know, how do you manage putting content out whilst you have a banner or a brand that you represent in the market without having to go through layers of approval every time before you want to share something meaningful to people in your industry? Life is about decisions. There are many organizations that you will be able to join that will not give you any headaches to do that. There will be far more that won't let you do it. Nobody's forcing you to work anywhere. If you're deciding that the stability or the right. income that you're getting from that job, this is, you know, uh, I'm in America, cannabis industry is going through a big transition, right? And you can't run ads for cannabis companies on Facebook and Instagram, it's against the terms of services as America figures out its marijuana cannabis laws. I, I go speak at this event and all these people come up to me, they're like, Facebook's screwing me, Gary. Fucking Instagram's fucking me. I'm like, no, it's not. They tell you what the rules are. You don't like the rules. You try to start an account, they shut you down. I don't like that companies act, want to be capitalists, but then treat their employees like it's communism. Right. Which is why I don't do it. Everyone, I don't, my employees can do whatever the fuck they want. They can start a Vayner Media within the company, do content and steal my, like, I don't give a shit because I'm not scared. Right. But the reality is you, you have to make a decision. Are you going to maximize your salary and not give a fuck about that rule? Or are you going to go find a job, right, that pays you maybe a little bit less but gives you the freedom you're looking for? It's as simple as that. Blended and happy, right? Exactly. What's that? Like blended and happy, right? That's right. Find that happy and here's what I love. When you really talk, this is why I love Q&A. Like when you have a logical conversation, the great thing is you're in charge. I understand what you'd like to happen. And I say to you, hey, are you going to take this $237,000 a year job that doesn't let you? Or do you want to take this $150,000 a year job that does? Yeah. I think what's remarkable is people are starting to realize the second job is starting to make sense. And that is not how we grew up the last 80 years when it was maximize money. Now it's maximize happiness and opportunity. Because if you take the 150 and you do your content, what you already know, you've already tasted it, is you're only three years away from making 430 on your terms. Right, correct. You're awesome, thank you. Thank you. Hi Gary, hey D-Rock. Uh, He's focused. Firstly, I want to start with saying that uh, you're my inspiration, you're my role model, you're my mentor. Thank you. And thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the sneakers you're wearing. (laughs) 
Uh, I'm another Indian that has come especially for you. Uh, I came to know that you were coming for this event and I thought this is the best opportunity I could get to see you live. Uh, my question to you is, uh, in an earlier interview of yours, you had spoken about having a chip on your shoulder that pushes you to do even more. What is the chip and what if someone doesn't realize what that chip should be for them? One more time, I want to understand. I understand the chip on the shoulder. What are you asking? So what is that chip for you? For me? Yeah. The chip for me was that the first 18 years of my life, the entire world besides my mother said that I was gonna lose. I'm 43 years old. I grew up in an America where going to a good college was the only indicator of you being successful. And I was a DNF student. So every teacher I had and all my friends' parents thought that I was the loser kid in the neighborhood and what I thought was they were the losers. <laughs> I was right. <laughs> so my chip, my chip was I was an immigrant. I came to a country, I didn't speak the language. I, you know, I was a terrible student. Every place in my life was telling me no, 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 except one place, when I sold lemonade, when I shoveled <clears> snow, <throat> when I sold baseball cards. There was this one place where there was nobody's judgment. It was just the market. Just the market decided. And that's where I was best. The market, not somebody's judgment. And that, that was my chip. Uh, follow up question. What if someone doesn't realize what that chip is for them? Then they won't be able to execute because if you are not self-aware about your own feelings, you are vulnerable. Mm. The question is, are you not willing to look? A lot of people in this room aren't willing to look because it's too painful to know where it's coming from. When most people's biggest problem here is a parent. That's not fun. That's not fun. And so I'm empathetic to that. Uh, one last thing. If you could sign my copy of Crushing It after this because that book changed my life. Uh, well, fuck, let's do it right now. Changing lives is what I'm here to do. Thank you very much. Get it. This is some real great fucking service around here you guys have. Thank you. Go ahead. Hey Gary, I'm a big fan. Thank you. Um, I like your show on YouTube, especially when you pick up just like a random phone call from people. Yes. And I see that you know a lot of, uh, a lot of advice you gave them is either going over your fear and yes. also crushing uh, one's ego. Now, uh, I was a U.S. Marines before I uh, yeah, opened my own great. business. So what I, wa I want to ask you is, how do you identify if you are taking action based on egos when you're kind of like immersed in that lifestyle for quite some time? And if you find that, how do you destroy that? You know, like, do you what think do you that's do? what's happening with you? Uh, I, I think let's some... Talk, let's talk. In, in some cases, I could be because... Uh, Ego is not confidence. Ego okay. is insecurity. Right? Okay. And when you're scared or nervous or not confident, a lot of people have DNA that makes them overcompensate. I call it a cactus. They're a cactus. They're tough on the outside, but they're soft on the inside. Mm. The reason I keep telling everybody kindness is a strength is I'm super nice and super passive, actually, and I'm like willing to let people take advantage of me because I'm strong inside. So the question is, you have to just know if you're nervous, if you're using you know, com fake confidence to actually hide something you're concerned about. Humility is an incredible strength that many men and many people never want to show. I talk, guys, I put out content more about me passing on Uber and losing than I do about the things I win on. Everybody else puts out content of fake wins. That's the difference. You understand? Yes. So the, you know, this is only something you can answer. When are you most insecure? How do you then act when it happens? And if you front, that's your defense mechanism and you need to understand that. Yeah, because the way, I mean, the way I would run my company, ideally, since I was brought up in the military, you know, everybody gotta do a certain way. If not, they'll get hammered for it. The problem is- And I is, know it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna work because they have options. 
Right. In the military, when you sign up and you're sergeant or general, whatever the fuck it is, like, fuck, you're like, fuck, I got, you gotta fucking do it. Yeah. In a business, they're like, that's good, I quit. <laughs> when you run a company, you work for everybody, not they work for you. Got it. And so, yeah. But that doesn't mean that there's plenty of things you've learned that are amazing. Like, and by the way, for many people, your, that system will work. You just have to know that as a leader, there isn't one thing that fits everybody. So either you find people that it works for or you develop the ability to manage people differently than just that way. That you decide. You don't have to do it the way I'm telling you to do it. You could just spend all your time finding people that like the military way and they like that vigor. Mm. I believe to scale, you have to have multiple ways to address issues, leadership, things of that nature. Got it. You got it. You got it. Hi. Hi. Hello, Gary. Yeah, I'm Barry Richarud, uh, 32 this year. So uh, I'd like to thank you because I've been following your content for a long time. Thank you. And then that has really uh, inspired me in my entrepreneurship journey. Thank you. So for me, is that uh, I actually, in the past, I also was uh, one of the guys that in secondary schools, I was uh, turned down by teachers, almost thrown out of uh, schools. And then I bootstrapped myself, uh, worked full time, and at the same time, built up my business. So yes. I got uh, a chain of Thai restaurants and food courts in Singapore. Very nice. Yeah, so now the question is that um, money doesn't really motivate me. me because either. along the way, I realized that I thought that I'm after money. But now I'm not really exactly wealthy, but I think I'm comfortable. But money just doesn't motivate me. And you like I, the process. Yeah, and I feel, I feel along the way, I discover what I truly love is that every time I face a problem, uh, ironically, I feel a bit happy because once I overcome that problem, I get to share with people. And then I realize that my true desire is to actually impact entrepreneurships, to inspire people, to continue to find their purpose, find their voice in life. And then now I'm stuck because I do have employees that I'm actually focusing to help them to bring up uh, to the next level. But at the same time, there is an inner desire of me wanting to share this. And I don't know whether do I need to continue to build my business and then share it later and impact lives later or do I do it concurrently? And what are the contents I should put up to the market? Do it now. Concurrently. Concurrently. Right. Okay. I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, yeah. there's, you know, you have permission because you've lived it. Just like that gentleman with the awesome yellow shirt. Don't fake what you don't, you know, certain things you haven't gotten to in your career yet. Uh, for example, I've started sprinkling it a little bit. I've been talking more about the year I've been mentioning lately. I don't, I've only a couple times, I don't know if you've heard this, but I'm starting to talk about how I think you have to love your company at first, but then you have to start bringing candor and merit, and I felt that I mismanaged VaynerMedia one year too late, and I created entitlement, and that was a problem for us. I needed to wait a couple years for that era to pass, because I didn't want to talk about something that people were living in my company at that moment, but you, know, you haven't lived everything yet, so, but you have to talk about it when you do, but you can do it concurrently. But when it talks about focus, then how do, how do I actually split my time? Who's focus? Who gets to decide what focus is? I have a fucking wine company, a shoe deal, content, VaynerMedia, a fucking wine library, Gary V, fucking baseball cards I'm trying to sell, garage sale. I'm the least fucking focused, focused fucker you'll ever meet. <laughs> Guys, if you're a real entrepreneur, you kind of can't just do one thing. That's how we're fucked up. Right? Like, I'm gonna come up with three business ideas in the next hour. And I'm gonna do that every day, and I'll probably do two of them in the year, because that's what makes us happy. You can do both. And Gary, one last question is, what kind of content do I do? Do I do like uh, my restaurant's content? Uh, what kind of content? Yeah, exactly. Well, if you're trying to impact and help, it needs to be more macro, it can't be literal, because most of us don't own restaurants. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, so Thank you everyone. Hi, Gary. Uh, I'm Bharat. I'm 27. I'm originally from India. I've been living in Singapore for the past few years. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say I love you. Thank you. I love you too. And um, uh, so I have a two-folded question. Uh, I had a stable job. I let it go a few years ago, and I've been doing things on my own. I'm a full-time trader, and I've set up an education business around it. It's going pretty good. But uh, you were talking about being lonely just now. 
So can you talk about that a bit more, especially when it's Are lonely? you lonely? No, I'm not, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm getting married in a couple of months, so clearly not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so my question was... But lonely as an entrepreneur or doing your own thing is a very different game than having somebody in your life. Exactly, so that's what I was uh, getting to. Uh, in terms of talking about being lonely when you don't kind of get the support from your family or from your close uh, people around you, like, uh, how do you deal with that and still... I deal with it extremely well because I love sticking it to people that don't think I've got it. I mean, even if it's your spouse, your Especially. parents... Especially. I'm being dead serious. Guys, I get, right? I understand how potentially disheartening it is when your fiance or parents or things don't believe in what you're doing, but it makes it so much more exciting when you achieve it because then you get to stick it to them. Well, I've never really thought it that way, but... Uh... Well, this is the way to think about it. <laughs> okay. And... No, but, like, but you have to understand. Nobody understands an entrepreneur if they're not an entrepreneur because they want safe. But for you, you'd be unhappy being safe. You just lived it. Yes. So I have empathy for her, but you're not capable of living your life any other way. So here's the best part of the argument, the debate, the issue. Somebody's gonna be right. Yes. Either you're gonna go and execute and provide for your family as an entrepreneur, and then you get to see, say to her, see? Or you're gonna fail and not provide and have to go get a job and then she gets to say, see. Right, when you That's the down. only two options. Either your parents are right or you're right. Either your husband is right or you're right. Either the commenters in your section are right or you're right. I spend no time on the cheering or the boos I spend on executing so that when it goes to zero, 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 I can say I was right. And just uh, slightly uh, adding on to that, uh, I know you've had uh, previous videos where you talked about uh, handling hate on social media, so kind of acknowledge them and you know, start a conversation. Bring I think, the yeah, keep positivity going. into it, but uh, how do you, uh, like, do you address every one of them? Or it, because at the end of the day, it still takes up your time. Yeah, I can't address all of my hate anymore, <laughs> but, but I think that too many people, when somebody says something they don't like to hear, dismiss it as hate and a troll. I read it and question it and then decide is there any merit to it? And the reason I've been able to evolve is because I don't just default if somebody disagrees with me or makes fun of me that they're wrong, I try to be thoughtful about what are they doing. Nine out of 10 times, it's because they're in a bad place and they're just trying to drag me down. But occasionally there's a point there that I kind of fester in and, and start subconsciously adjusting what I'm doing. Feedback is important. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Hi Gary. One more. Guys, I only have time for one more question, I apologize. Hi Gary, uh, my name is Regan. So basically I wanna ask, as an entrepreneur, we are hustling every single day. Yes. Um, and sometimes, you know, we are like workaholics. We don't yes. even know when time passes by. Yes. Um, but sometimes, um, how do you actually account for how much you have actually done? Or how do you account, you know, how productive you have uh, been as an entrepreneur today? For example, I could write one article and I could be very productive. I could write three, art uh, three articles, but I'm not productive. So how do you actually account of, you know, how much work I have done as an entrepreneur? You, it sounds like you're doing what we all do, which is it sounds like you're being your own judge and jury. Right. So I think you just need to love yourself more. Right. <laughs> I'm being serious. It's yes, a very yes. interesting insight. Like when you were asking the question, I think every day I'm phenomenal. I'm being dead serious because I'm trying as hard as I can. I have very good intent. I'm really trying. And if today was a less productive day because I was tired or a meeting didn't go well or who knows why, I'm just not capable of beating myself up today. I look at it over the course of time. I mean, I, you know, you get to be the judge and the jury. Right, right. And one more question is actually about uh, millennials actually. Um, is that a lot of times people see that, oh, this guy's too young, or for me as a Singaporean, you know, it's like you haven't go army, why should I listen to you? Yes. And you also say about being authentic. Yes. Right, but I'm being authentic, and sometimes people still don't believe, uh, 
let's say my um, experience or portfolio. That was my whole life from 20 to 40. Right. Right. So basically, um, do, just be authentic and just share with the world what you just really want to share. What's the alternative? Make shit up? <laughs> All right. You know what I mean? Yes. Look, I, I am the bot. Everything that you now know me for is nothing I was saying and doing was accepted when I was doing it. Guys, I launched an e-commerce business in 1996. People thought the internet was a fad. Email, Google AdWords. I started one of the first YouTube shows ever. I invested in Facebook and Twitter before anybody had heard of it. Tumblr, like Uber, like everything. I started having a man follow me with a camera three years ago. People thought that, like everything I do, you're gonna be the, like you can't be upset and try to convince people who are gonna judge you on age, you just need to move on to the next person and figure out which one's not gonna judge you on age. And by the way, youngsters, take it from everybody, who's over 40 here, raise your hands. Raise it high. Us with our hands up, we lived in a world where 100% of 20 year olds and 25 year olds were not listened to. Because technology became big, you guys are way more respected than we were at 25. You're over-respected. I mean it. People think, oh, you're a kid. You understand technology. No, you don't. So the reality is, you sh- ju- you've heard a lot of this today. Right. Don't be in the convincing business. Go to who's already convinced. All right. Hmm. You know you. what I mean? Thank you so much. Gary. You got it. Hey, Gary. Last yes. question. Last question. Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Jillian, and I've been following you for the last one and a half years. Uh, you're the only one with um, the post notifications turned on on my Instagram. Thank you. <laughs> and I love how you're pounding the same messages every day. It's very consistent and it's very easy to, to remember and follow. Thank you. Um, but also, you know, I wanted to bring to a point, like how do you, you talked about um, framing contextual creative at scale. Yes. How do you do that? Um, or do you have a structure or how do you frame it? And I understand you also mentioned to one of the ladies, Marie or something, um, that you know, Q&A is one of the innovative ways, but what are the other ways aside from like the three different so you know, types of... What I mean by that in its m- most important form is when you're talking to somebody, you need to relate to them. Mm-hmm. So if you're making a piece of content to 18 to 20 year olds, you need to use adjectives and cultural references to an 18 to 20 year old. Does so, it, cursing? you know what I mean? I mean like, that, that's the point. The point is you need to make it contextual to the audience. When mm. I speak here, there's a lot of things that I didn't say today that I would have definitely said if I was in New York because it would have made sense to New Yorkers but wouldn't have made sense here. Mm-hmm. You know, I, on YouTube, I can make a 41 minute video On Instagram, it was a minute, then IGTV came, and now it can be 41. So you have to respect the platform, Mm -hmm. but first you have to respect who you're trying to reach. Okay. So when I say contextual at scale, it's what audience are you trying to reach, and then do you use what slang, what references, you understand? Yeah. Too many people are trying to reach everybody, which means you're not reaching anybody. It's vanilla. Mm -hmm. You understand? So... Again, this is a theme of this talk. When you make so much content, when I make a co- video that says 50 years for the next 50 years, 50 year olds, you've got 50 more years to live, and the whole video is, hey, are you 50? Are you out of your mind? You're still young, let's go, let me tell you why. You're gonna live longer, which means you're only halfway, but you grew up in an era where 50 was old when we were kids, and da da da. No 21 year old is watching that video. Mm-hmm. Maybe they watch it quickly because they like me and they pass it to their parent. When I make a video that says, fuck your parents, <gasps> the kids love that. The parents are DMing me like, you motherfucker. I'm like, fuck <laughs> you. You know, so that's what I mean. Okay, so thank you for coming to my home country, Singapore. Thank you. Uh, what contextual creative would you do for this? What kind of slangs do you have for our Singaporean market? The number one thing <laughs> that I think about for this market in this yeah. region is the dynamic of parents' pressure on children. Mm. Whoa. <laughs> it is my number one. It is my number one. It is a problem in America, but it is absolutely more prevalent in Asian countries where parents 
think kids' success is an indicator on them and they treat their children like products, not like children. Thank you for that. Um, I agree with you. I actually like quit my corporate job to uh, train professionally as an athlete. So despite my parents' notion of the ambition and just went for what I love. I love it. Thank you. Singapore, thank you. I'm sorry. All right. Sign?